Hello and welcome to another episode of the Sci-Fi Chat Podcast. We have been away for a while. As you can see, we've got a little slightly different layout this time, but we are back now and we're going to keep going with our conversation on science fiction. So, do you want to introduce yourself, Jen? Well, yes, I think everybody already knows. I'm Jennifer Kirk. And I'm Zoe Kirk Robinson. And today we're going to have an interesting topic for you. Okay. As, well, as we always do, isn't Oh, right, yes. Oh, absolutely. What have you got for us first up? Okay, the first question we have today for this podcast is, are there rules to science fiction? I could be really annoying here and say, no. Right, next question. <laughs> <laughs> Why are there no rules? Why do you say there are no rules? I do, well, I think there's, there, there must be some rules, otherwise everything would be science fiction. There's got to be some defining rules that make it science fiction as opposed to something else. Um... But I think science fiction is very, very open. I mean, you can have books like, for example, uh, Ward Moore's Bring the Jubilee or Keith Roberts's Pervane, which they're very much not really about the science, but they're still classified as science fiction. Um, Do you want to explain what Pervane is, for example? Pervane is like an alternative history um, as is Ward Moore's Bring the Jubilee and it takes as its premise what if the Spanish had uh, been successful with the Spanish Armada and had actually taken over Britain and it, then it takes that as its key starting point the point where history uh, the two histories uh, diverge from each other and then it brings it forward I think it's actually set in the 1960s um, but it's based on the premise of that having happened at that point in the past and how would society have, have changed and so in Pervain it's a very backward society the Catholic Church still holds sway and there's still this kind of inquisition on uh, and so technology is frowned upon and uh, so you know it's it's a very different Britain from how Britain actually was in the 1960s and if you go to Wardmore's Bring the Jubilee, that key starting point where its history diverges is the uh, American Civil War. And its premise is what if the Confederate nation, uh, what if the Confederate states, I, I should say, had actually won? Um, and it brings that forward to the 1930s and it's got that as its key premise. So things are very much... Um, you know, technology hasn't advanced as much, um, and um, the, the the North, the the United States, in the North is very very backward, um, and almost like a um, once you go outside the city, it's very lawless. And then it, it sets its story within that backdrop, but the story itself isn't really science fiction in any way. It's just following the life of of this one person. Would I be right in my, having not read a generalised statement, that these two alternative history books mm -hmm. are more science fiction in terms of what if, what would society be like if science hadn't progressed the way it had in our world? Yeah, I mean, you could argue that Philip K. Dix, The Man in the High Castle, falls into that kind of little subgenre of mm. alternative histories. Um, where it's well, not to really be honest about with you, the science. It's not. It never is. Uh, Phil K. Dick's always about the human factor. Mm. But also, with The Man in the High Castle, it's definite science fiction because it's an alternative reality. It's a different dimension where someone in that dimension has managed to see into a different dimension and it's not ours. None of them are ours. And then right at the end, one guy passes through from that first dimension into what appears to be the second. Oh, uh, just just in case we forget. Spoilers! If you don't want the ending of that book blowing, then don't watch the bit that you just watched. It's 40 years old, almost 50 years old. That book is half a century old. There is a time limit on spoilers. Sorry guys, there's but, a time limit. But, I mean, By I... the way, the Titanic sinks. Oh, blow the ending, why don't you? Right, yes. You know what happens at the end of King Kong? Yes, he, do, he doesn't do. climb down off the Empire State Building. No, he, he bungee jumps. He, he goes, Banzai! 
And I would say science fiction definitely does have rules. I know what you're saying there, it doesn't, but science fiction, I believe, has definite rules. Otherwise, it just becomes a drama or standard genre fiction. I think I believe is. science fiction has to be any story that requires some kind of basis in science, whether it's a case of what if science didn't work the way that science works here? So we have faster than light travel. That's, that's still science fiction. Science doesn't work like that, but science fiction, because we decided everything is the same as our world, except for this bit, we've changed that, what would happen? Or let's take science exactly as it is now, but this theory that we have, what if that was true? What can we extrapolate from that? Then we get into hard science fiction like Greg Egan, where it is entirely based on what if a certain theory is true? What could we draw from that and create a story and some conflict from that? I believe science fiction requires a basis in science of some kind, whether it's different science, whether it's a modified version of one or two rules, anything like that. I think then, that's what's required. But then Ward Moore's Bring the Jubilee or Keith Roberts's Bavane, which are two examples that I'll give, they're, they're classed as science fiction, but where, where's this, this, this scientific thing? Well, what you're saying is that Science hasn't progressed the same way as it has in our world. It was stifled. But do, is that what's making it science fiction? Probably, yeah. So it's basically working on a different level of science. But then, then you could argue, you know, um, Hounds of the Baskerville um, by Conan Doyle. Is that science fiction? Because It's, it's a detective story based on the premise that you can cause something to glow. The Hounds of the Baskervilles? No, it's... Uh, the, the dog glows because of uh, something that's been applied to it, isn't it? Hounds of the Baskervilles just happened to have a copy to hand. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. It, it's like a murder mystery, but mm. it, it's got a, a horror element in. Because it, it's... Um, let's see, let's see. He learns about the ancient myth of the Baskerville Hound, and as he uncovers the malevolent... Malevolent. Malevolent fury that lay behind Baskerville's death, he comes perilously close to meeting his own. Um, it, I wouldn't. It's not really science fiction. It sounds more like this is the Victorian it's horror. horror novel. Yeah, I'd say that that's more horror. Well, and that's then, the thing. Where does science fi sci-fi start? We've had this discussion before. Yeah, where does sci-fi end and horror begin? Or is horror actually an offshoot of science fiction? Or is science fiction an offshoot from horror? Neither. Horror comes from the Victorian ghost story by Dracula, uh, Varney the Vampire, things like that, which also, funnily enough, causes uh, teen romance. And uh, <laughs> it's true. Varney the Vampire is more like uh, a titillation story for a lot of its uh, run. It's a bit, a bit of an oddity. But horror gave way to, to a certain extent, the pulps with weird fiction. And that's where science fiction, as we know it, comes from. Rather than directly H.G. Wells all the way through to now, it's H.G. Wells via this detour into well, no, weird fiction and Jules, then back into... Jules Verne's before H.G. Wells. Yes, but uh, Jules Verne is the soft side of sci-fi. H.G. Wells was trying to do more hard sci-fi, and that's where the two sides of science fiction come from. The different versions, but the old, both of them well, went off via weird no, fiction see, in the Jules, 20s. Jules Verne would have been considered hard sci-fi if there was such a thing at the time, because... He wasn't. He was considered a romanticist. Well, no, when you look at the technology illustrated in Jules Verne's books, they may seem pretty tame and oldie-worldie by today's standards, but at the time, he was writing at the cutting edge and beyond the cutting edge, as was, of science. Fair enough, I will, uh, I will accept that. But either way, both of them are what if science was different? So I think just to bring this back on track, um, does science fiction have rules? What we can deduce from this is yes, but they're very complicated and we'll let you know when you break them, not before. There's no rule book in advance. I can guarantee the fandom will let you know if you break the rules. Yes, yeah, they will. But then, then you see, like, fantasy fiction. Where does science fiction become fantasy fiction? And you could argue that 
Uh, something like, say, Star Wars, Space Wizards. Is that fantasy or is that sci-fi? See, Star Wars is the joining between science fiction and fantasy fiction because Star Wars requires magic. Pretty the much. The Force is magic. Hmm. And that's, I believe, is the only thing that anyone has ever managed to agree is the difference between science fiction and fantasy is that fantasy allows magic and sci-fi doesn't. Oh, but fantasy who, doesn't require magic, but it does allow it. But who was it who said that to um, any technology sufficiently advanced will appear as if like magic? Clark's first law. Yeah. So, you know, if you took... If you took an iPhone back and showed this to a caveman they would they would they would be like what witchcraft is this and it, it's not magic we know how it works mm. but to a caveman it would be magic funny enough in one of these books that we've got here the writing ones where is it now a lot of people have a lot to say about Orson Scott Card however the guy knows his stuff when it comes to writing and he I believe it was in this one, wrote a short story which was part of a larger science fiction story. He'd taken out a chapter and expanded it into a short story to try and sell it in order to get interest in this book. I'm pretty sure it was Austin Scott Card. It may have been one of the other guys with the books that we've got up there, and I can't remember, but I'm pretty sure it's this guy. And because he'd taken out the context of his science fiction, what was left appeared to be fantasy. Hmm. He knew that the, techno the, the technology he was using was in aid to this person that was central to this story. But he hadn't written that into that particular chapter. So when he expanded the story, it didn't look science fiction. It looked fantasy. It looked like the guy was using psychic powers. I mean, you could argue this. Um, I've got a series of e-books which you've yet to actually finish. Um, doing I will edit them, sorry. But uh, that was, I wrote um, a fantasy fiction, science fiction crossover type thing. And you could take chapters of that um, out of context and they would be little kind of self self-contained short stories. Mm. But they wouldn't necessarily make a thing about the science in some or the fantasy in another. So they could sort of jump backwards and forwards depending on which chapter you took out of context. You pulled a He-Man. He-Man? He-Man and the Masters of the Universe is a story about a prince who becomes a barbarian-style warrior when he holds aloft a magic sword and magic. says by the power of Grayskull. Magic! However, he lives in a high science world with space travel, Mm -hmm. faster than uh, sound travel in jets. He's got all kinds of technology in his castle. He's got radar. He can see clearly through drones uh, what's going on with Skeletor. It's a science world with mm -hmm. magic. Oh, you could argue uh, Superman is... Uh, that's, that's kind of like magic, seeing through walls and uh, laser beams shooting out of his eyes. There's no scientific mumbo-jumbo to back any of that up. It Except just when happens. Superman was uh, originally created, every single part of his powers came from the fact that he came from a higher gravity world. Yeah, but that doesn't explain shooting laser beams from your eyes. When he started, Superman couldn't do that. He had... Immense could he strength. see through walls? He couldn't see through walls. He couldn't fire laser beams through his eyes. He couldn't fly. He could just yeah. jump really high and he had so a lot magic, of strength. The magic comes later. Everything comes from power creep, as they call it. Right, right. Yeah, it's like uh, you, you you, can't have all this at the start, but if you had a little bit, a little, a little bit, bit and then it's like bit. salami slices, at what point do you go, oh no, hold on? Because it's all introduced slowly, slowly over time. And then all of a sudden you look back and go, oh God, they've changed. Yeah. But it, but it was so gradual you didn't notice at the time. Anyway, it changed so much that at the end, by the 80s, there were two Supermen. And I think at this point we need to round this up and, and finish. So uh, Yeah, I say there are rules. They may not be hard and fast, but there are certain rules to science fiction. I, I'd agree with that. I'd say, yes, there are rules but nobody will agree on the definition of those rules. They're not black and white rules. There's a lot of grayscale going on in there, but there are some rules nonetheless. And whilst they probably can't all be explained in advance, clearly you'll probably get a sense of if you've not met the criteria or not. If you don't <laughs> the fan base will tell you.
Yeah, no, no, but when you're writing something, you kind of get a sense of, is this sci-fi mm. or is this not? Yeah, I think I agree. Okay.